privilege to call this guy a friend. He's our SCPGA Golf Science Advisor. Boy, are we lucky to have him on our team. Mr. Art Maffei. Thank you, Billy. How's the, how's the noise back there from this Italian? Okay? I don't mind yelling. This is about the top of my, uh, my bucket list. Uh, I was involved in rockets and science and things of that nature, and I got hurt in 2002 after I retired. And I wanted to put my brain to use in something. I spent the next five years studying religions. And then I said, you know what? I played baseball in college. And what was fascinating about that, I had a teacher that was on the Hawaiian Islands with people like Ted Williams and Konstanty and Kozuski, and, and he got me to throw a fastball. And he said, we just want you to have this one basic pitch and know when it's working and when it's not. And when it's not, I'm going to take you out of there. But you're going to be depending upon that. And I said, what a nice thought for golf. If there was some place you could go that would be dependable, and then you could apply all the finesse aspects of it that we just heard from Boyd. And so that's what I set out to do. I wanted to understand how the body worked, not how the club worked, I'd get around to that. So that's just a, a little bit of an introduction to tell you where I'm going. I truly believe as I stand here in front of this very astute audience, very schooled in golf, that I can make every golfer better in 15 minutes and I don't sell anything. I understand the body enough. When I sat through this briefing that we just heard, I had tears in my eyes. It sounds so difficult. I'm 82 years old, and I can hit the ball straight as long as I want. And I couldn't walk about eight years ago. Made it too hard. So what my study amounts to is how the body really functions during this time. So quickly, as far as the PGA, Billy, thank you. I didn't know I was a science advisor. <laughs> that's, that's pretty great. In, in rocketry, uh, I took science from the research into the development, into the flights, and I'll tell you about that later. But I'm arranging today, uh, according to why am I here, I don't want to tell you about who I am, and then I don't want to tell you about how what I've been doing works, and then I'm going to get around and give you the demonstration of exactly what are we talking about. What is it in the swing that will allow you to get to these, what I now call principles. I was searching for golf truth, and golf truth turns out to me to be about four or five principles of dynamic balance. So, how did I get introduced to you folks? I was at a cracker barrel meeting, and I had 15 minutes, and then we went out on the driving range, and I, I had some time with Jimmy Rossetto, and also with Eric Evans. That was maybe three or four years ago. Billy then was nice enough to, uh, to invite me to your business summit. And at the business summit, I showed some data one of Sean Foley's uh, students increasing his capacity the distance 10% and shrinking his dispersion by close to 50%. I think it was 45%. Those are kind of gee whizzes things, but that's turned out to be consistent. Over 400 people that I've come in contact with that I'm kind of a range rat. I just say, hey, I'm a scientist. Could you help me hit these balls and see what happens to them? So sometime a little later in this presentation, I'm going to ask Billy to say a little bit more, I'm going to ask Mickey Azuki, who's a, a teacher, and I'm going to ask Tim Mitchell to come and just tell you what their experiences have been as we have gotten together. So it's not going to be all me. So why am I here? Why am I here? Because I want you all to have this addendum package of dynamic balance to understand. You know, we can't get it done in this time before lunch. We're going to get hungry real soon. So I want you to take a business card sometime during my presentation and write on the back of it if you'd like to see me again. I'd be happy to come to you or we can make some compromises to where we go. I want people to enjoy this game more. Distance and accuracy are really great, but golf enjoyment is where I'm coming from. It's kind of a spiritual trip with me, and please bear with it because I think you'll get something out of it. So what has happened with these uh, I guess it was at the end of the presentation for, uh, for the business aspect. I had all these successes, and I was standing in line talking to a few people, 
And someone very generously came up to me and said, I didn't believe you when I heard you before, and I still don't believe you now. And I said, Chief, I'm having trouble with beliefs. I better do something about that. So I went into the internet, and I found out that there's TED Talks. And what TED Talks allows you to do is search. And the search that I stopped on was the search that says you want to tell people why you're doing something first, then tell them how you're doing it, and finally tell them what you're doing. So that's what I'm going to do today. So I've kind of introduced and told you why I want to do this. I want you to take what I'm saying, and hopefully it will make a difference in, in how you understand it. And I'd be happy to visit. We'll get together with you. And it's all about dynamic balance. So what about, what about me? Well, I loved when uh, Mr. Marr talked about his dad at the last uh, conference I was at. So I want to tell you a little about my dad and my brother and my mom and stuff. And I know, oh, Chief, you're so boring, Art, but I don't mean to be boring. My dad was a musician, he was an inventor, and he was a great guidance for me, but he never saw me play baseball. So sports and my dad and I were just not connected there. But he gave me some interesting ways to say that little things son, make big differences. And so when I look at this dynamic balance, to me, this little thing is gonna make a big difference. Story goes like this. My dad was, uh, he was a, conductor at Radio City Music Hall, what they call a rehearsal conductor. <clears throat> and came up to him and said, Danny, I've known you for a long time. I want you to take a day off. I've already got a substitute for you. We're doing a show down the street here, and it's in rehearsal, and I want you to tell me if you like it. So my dad went to the show, and at the end of that day, he said, yeah, I think it's a good show. You'll recognize the guy asking my dad these questions. He then, uh, came back to him two weeks later and he said, Danny, we're going up to New Haven, Connecticut. We're going to try this out. You know, Broadway shows get into the demographics to see whether or not they're going to really sell in New York because it's a big expense to get them going. So they went up to New Haven and Dad conducted the, hired the orchestra and conducted the uh, dress rehearsal. And what happened at the end of the dress rehearsal? Here comes this man again. And he said, uh, Danny, what do you think now? And my dad said, uh, Look, he said, I told you in New York, you need to change the name, just a little thing. And I'm telling you again, you need to change the name. He said, well, haven't you been outside to see the marquee? We changed the name from Green Road to the Lilacs to Away We Go. My dad said, that's not what I told you. The guy said, what you told me is crazy, Dominic. Nobody from New York will ever go to see a show called Oklahoma. And so that show was the longest running show before uh, I think it was My Fair Lady came out, but it was a little thing, and they formed the show around that song, and it made a big difference. And so I want to form my talk around dynamic balance to hopefully make a, a big difference with you. Thanks for spending the time with me there to get through that, but that's a big deal. I'd like to pay respects to my parents. My brother is an MIT graduate. He got his PhD down at Wharton. He was instrumental in the electronic computer. He also was one of the founders of a system called Operations Research, which is a, a form of high-order mathematics that looks for optimum solutions, the best solution. I use those kind of techniques. I was homeschooled from an MIT guy and from a Wharton, Wharton guy as a result of him coming home on vacations and things. So then when I did my educational process, I was kind of inclined that way, but I also had this athletic desire, so I combined the athletic desire with the desire to be finding the best solutions. So the best solution to me, again, turned out in golf. What I found is that in a literature of a thousand papers that I worked with, that nobody took the time to understand how the body really works or where the body really came from. So let me start with that. We were on all fours at one time, and you might giggle a little bit at that, but when we stood up, these joints got different, very, op very operative in golf, and these joints got different. The brain didn't have enough room to change very much. And what happened on all fours is if you fell, you obviously wouldn't get hurt too much because you didn't fall from very far. But when you got on twos, you had this very little platform to work on. And if you fell, that energy, just from the height you were falling, would be very detrimental. Well, you fall every time you make a golf swing. 
And if you don't believe me, simply look at some of these traces that are coming off devices like Mr. Neff, who you'll hear from later, or Body Track. And you see a bunch of wiggles, and people try to make up some form of comments about what those wiggles might mean. Those wiggles mean that something is going on inside the body to rescue itself. And as it rescues itself, that's an amount of energy that's being subtracted from the clubhead. So the better you feel when you swing can result in a better swing outcome. But most of all, when you're not dynamically balanced in certain fashion, you're going to miss the ball and hit really bad shots. So what I am all about now is what is the sequence that you go through as far as balance is concerned. And I'd like to start with, Billy, maybe you could help me uh, by swinging a club and just telling people what you're experiencing. Gladly. So Billy puts his two feet together, and this is just, I, well, if you come up here, you got room to do it, Bill. I, I just want, with your feet together, you swing the club back and forth at, at horizontally, Bill. Baseball okay. swings. And, and tell people what you're experiencing in your feet. All kinds of movements. Now, if you think of the mathematics of what's happening with Billy right now, that club head is kind of pulling him this way. And his, his body doesn't have much of a base of support, so he's having trouble with the base of support. And so that manifests itself in a body reaction. And that's my major finding, is that when the body does its own involuntary correcting, the teacher and the student try to find a compensation for whatever that looked like to them. So that compensation comes on top of a reflex action and it's insufficient time for that to be carried through to end up in a good result. Now that problem is really a timing problem. You've only got a quarter of a second to go from the top to the bottom. So what, what we do about that is we kind of just spread our feet out. So now that Billy's done that, I'm, the back of the room, you can't see this, but I'm sure uh, you can understand what I'm about to say. So Billy, twist your foot in and out. What Billy's doing is he's showing me what the internal and external rotation is of his hip. So Billy's foot went in about here, but it goes out past 90 degrees. So the first thing that you want to do, Bill, is you want to place that foot someplace in the middle. This is the beginning of the optimization process. I did that with uh, Troy Mullen, a lady golfer. Uh, it was at Riviera about six weeks ago, and she was going to compete in the long drive champ. And in five minutes, her swing speed went from 160 to 170, uh, her ball speed went from 160 to 173. And she got to the quarterfinals. Now she had been practicing her way for uh, who knows how long, I don't know. I just was with her for a few hours. I watched how she was limited because of each femur coming into the what's called the acetabulum or the hip socket has a variation of the angle in which it goes in there. So if you are kind of locked and you can't get back, you'll tend to extend or stand up, and that's the immediate compensation. The body won't like that. Because when I sum the forces, as Billy goes through his swing, if you just go to the top of your back swing, you'll know about hitting me. As you come down to arm parallel to the ground, club vertical, the peaks of what we would call the kinematic sequence, that's when everything here is going its fastest, except the club. The club is going to get to go faster. But there's a force field on Billy that's doing this to him. In other words, the centrically generated forces in his body is going to throw it over that. So when you have a tire like that on your car, what you do is take it to the tire station and they put a weight on it, and then it rotates more freely. So Billy's weight is going to be what I unfortunately call in the literature bumpy back. And at this public hearing on that camera, Jim, I am going to strip that away, as my wife wants to call it, back, hip, back. 
So now what I want Billy to do is get set up again. And I just want you to put your back hip back. It looks a little silly that way. The purpose is to just get that hip bottomed out. When I was with Mr. Foley, 2011, walking down the freeway, the uh, fairway at, uh, at Sherwood, I was explaining this to him and he said, I don't get it and I don't believe it. I said, well, suppose, Sean, we're going to have a foot race and a big fat Italian is going to run against you and we put the blocks in the track and now we get set to run in the blocks but I say, hey, Sean, put your foot six inches forward. He said, that's not fair. I said, why then do you let your golfers play that way? He said, what do you mean? Well, I told you that we are a species where this is a very necessary rotation. But look how loose that is. How can you get to a specific point with your hips or your shoulders with that much slack in there? If you had that in the steering wheel of your car, you'd hit every telephone pole you were trying to get by. So the important part of that from the mechanical side, from the scientific side, when you have something that is moving that easily, we put in what we call, unfortunate word, stiffness. Stiffness instead of what I call firmness. So when we put this rear hip back, we put it to firm up this area. Now when we start in the downswing, after this amount of energy is going to be put into the club, transferred into the club, it's in a repeatable starting spot. The muscles in that area have been pre-activated. And that pre-activation is going to allow that swing to repeat itself. So that's a, a stabilizing function as well as, you need a microphone, Bill? No. I was going to say that Boyd mentioned Henrik Stenson. What a great ball striker. He had this thing that was a little weird. We've all seen Henrik Stenson right before he starts goes, bloop. He sort of leans back. And he's doing the exact thing as far as I'm concerned. So anybody that's a competent golfer like most of you here are, you will seek some form of balancing mechanism, which, which is going to just come instinctively by trial and error. My point is, why not rid yourself of that? Why not place this where you know what the characteristics are of your own personal hip, as far as the ground is concerned with that flare, and then why not get in a starting spot, which will be admittedly slightly closed, but from that position, then you can just swing any ordinary way that comes naturally for you. So that's, that's the second step. Now the part, the title of this, this speech is the the stories, the swing, and the science. So in 2008, I was at the, uh, the lakes in El Segundo uh, Christmas Eve. I had done my Christmas shopping. It was raining, drizzling. And I was one of three people on the range. I was in the middle. And so I finished hitting the balls, and this voice behind me said, wow, you're going to hit that ball OK. And I said, well, as an old baseball player, and I'm trying to get that the heck out of my swing because that would be coming out like that. And he said, oh, he said, are you taking lessons? I said, yeah, I'm taking lessons from someone here at the lakes and I'd be happy to have you meet him if you would want. And he stuck his hand on me and he said, yeah, I play a little baseball too. My name is Ernie Banks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now with the, the Cubs at the World Series, that's kind of an appropriate thing. But that developed into a friendship. As you know, unfortunately, he has passed away. But, uh, but the friendship uh, in the following spring, and this is another part of the science I'm going to get to, telling the story to start with, is that I was on the tee again, and I didn't know he was there, and I took a couple of swings, and I heard that voice again, and I said, oh, Arnie, welcome back. He would spend some several weeks a year on the West Coast. I said, look what I got now. I said, remember this? Brought me back. I said, watch this. Swing like Ernie L's. And I turned back and I realized what I had just done. I said, oh my god, I'll tell that story a thousand times, Ernie, but it will be this. Swing like Ernie Banks. And so I've changed that from that standpoint. But with that, I realized that the reason that that is efficient is a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 count. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
and there's a resonance in the body. Remember I told you the body will protect itself from falling. The other thing the body does is it's got pneumatics up here. Those are your lungs. It's got hydraulics in here, which is your stomach and your digestive system. It's got your rib cage protecting your heart and stuff like that. And then it's got these bones and these muscles. And if you treat it as a complete system, which is what I did before I took it apart, the complete system will operate in a very repeatable way. And if I, if you, as I have done, take a look at all the track man and flight scope data, what's the most re singularly repeatable parameter as far as the standard deviation is concerned, it turns out to be swing speed when you're attempting the same shot. So the body's, from an energy standpoint, is capable of very accurately reproducing that. Not so angle of attack, not so swing path, not so all the other parameters you pay a lot of attention to. But from the energy standpoint, the resonance of the body is a very dependable device that you can count on. So I was doing a video with Billy, and so I was giving him the 541, 54321 routine, and Billy says, Hey, you're a rocket scientist, Art. It ought to be 4321 launch. And so I have adopted 4321 launch, found a scientist that really knew he was talking about, two of them actually, on the timing of the body and how the body is constructed and what the, the, the characteristics of the muscles are and things of that nature. His name is Dr. Robert Grover. You might remember that name. He put out a club up in the market called the Sonic Club. And he, uh, I think it was Haney that used it with uh, Charles Barkley. And uh, Haney would swing it and Barkley would try and replicate the sound of that. At any rate, the arithmetic that went into that resonance associated with swinging the club also extended to lower swing speeds and maximum swing speeds. And so the resonance can be depended upon for this go-to type swinging for lesser than 100% shots as 3 2 1 and launch. So you can go from 4 3 2 1 launch to 3 2 1 launch, and then putting can change that one more time to 2 1 launch. So there's a, there's a cadence associated with each type of the swing depending upon the energy level that's being put in there. Now, I don't say that it should be exactly what I'm telling you, but you should start from that point, and then you should change it slightly without changing anything else, and you will stabilize that very important characteristic to your own, what I would call, optimum set of conditions. And that's, that's a learning methodology, a teaching methodology, and a training methodology that I have used to get these 400 people in short order to repeat things that were better than what they started with. So that's, we're now with the flare. We've got the bumpy back. And we've got the timing of 4 3 2 1 launch. Can I add something about that? I had my, I'm here today at 50 because at age 14, my teacher, John Mahoney at the time, used to tell me, he'd go, he'd say something like, 1 2 3 hit. And he came and he grabbed me like this and put my club and he went, 1 2 3 hit, 1 2 3 hit. And back, if anyone's ever read the inner game of golf, back hit, whatever. And in that moment, the next ball I hit, I looked down at the ball and it looked, at least twice as big, and it looks like it looked to me as though it were standing still, and I, I crushed it. I'm, oh, wow, that was fun. And halfway back on the ball after that, I went, I'm going to be a golf pro. I knew I had it. And it was the same thing that Arts rekindled, and that's why, I don't know, I'm playing better, hitting it farther, whatever. It was just the same thing. It, was, it took its stability and balance and a certain quietness, but also I'm, what's going on in my head instead of uh, elbow this way, arm that way, on plane, wrist release, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's one, two, three, one, or five, four, three, two, launch. Five, four, three, two, one, launch. One of those cadences that I'm keeping at all times when I'm playing now. So anyway, thanks for that. Okay, well, it, 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 it was easy to understand for me once I read some papers that said, well, if these things approximate these mechanical systems that closely, and along with Bob Grober, Dr. Grober, there is a person whose name comes up in any aspect of how the spine is operating properly for human beings or not properly for people that have diseases like MS or possibly Parkinson's. His name is Chilowicki. There's Jen, da Jen, Jen Bab, Chilowicki, Art Schultz, 
Hodges are experts in this field of how the spine works. And so I took a real liking to the spine because I fell out of a loft in my garage in 2002, and I was left for someone that wouldn't be able to play sports anymore. And that was my year of retirement. So all of a sudden, this got really personal with me, but how could I mess up my back that much? That when I finished with all the investigations of MRIs and break, fixing all the broken bones, my next step was to be fusing the entire lumbar section of my spine and at least three epidurals to keep the pain down at some reasonable level. Well, that wasn't acceptable to me either. Uh, I just want to know, are there any alternate paths? And the alternate path to me was sitting with Dr. Watkins, who is the guy that's fixed just about everybody's back, and with his neurologist, and asking him to show me where the problems were in my back. And it turned out I had structural problems. I had actually put stuff where it didn't belong. So I decided to spend a few years getting somebody that could at least try and place those pieces where they returned to. So you're looking at an 82-year-old that really feels great about everything now and can move reasonably, plays tennis and golf. And what I love about golf is that it keeps me outside and it, it's a way of life as opposed to just something else that I could do during the day. So structure became very important and the structure is now straight. But it led me to what in the world is happening to the golf profession if almost 50% of the professionals and 50% of the amateurs have bad backs. Where is that coming from? Well, that's been a really tough grind, and I think I'm only, honestly, 20% into that understanding right now. But the 20% is a good 20% because there are people that are looking at details of how the muscles and the vertebrae and things of that are being affected by the various swing styles. Well, one of the things that so far is pretty darn obvious is that when you have a spine angle towards the target, which I saw a bunch of pictures of a little while ago, and when you turn this upper body, you compress the spine, vertebrae on the inside of the lumbar here, and then you turn it. And if any of you were into woodworking, that's exactly how a lathe works, is if you bend something, you stick a cutter in there, and then you turn on the lathe, and you cut the chips away. So obviously, that didn't sound sensible to me. So as part of this placing the rear hip back, I determined that what is called the bottom of the spine, it has a name of coccyx. Just think of the, the frozen part of your spine. That needs to either point down or point to the back of your right foot. So that your spine now, if we're going to hit in that direction, the top of your body is going this way. And then as you insert into the pelvis, the lower part of the body is straight up and down. It's a parameter we call crunch factor. You may not have heard of that before. It's the crudest of measurements as to what's happening in the rotational rates. But it's the only indication we have right now. So I'm appealing to the PGA and other places to put some money in universities to start looking at why are our backs being damaged. There's no paper you can pick up and read and say we, we shouldn't do that anymore. There'll be just as many people on the tour that have bad backs next year as were percentage-wise as had bad backs 10 years ago. That's crazy. For sport we're trying to revive, we ought to pay attention to that because, as you know from your Golf 2 studies that were done by Boston Computing, that there's a, in this country there's something like 30 million golfers, but there's 90 million that quit because of some form of unhappiness, some of which was bodily damage or hurting. So I truly believe that there's a possibility that by getting dynamically stable at the lower body, following just the basic kindergarten arithmetic that I've used, I've had no help from computers or universities. This is all self-digested, imposed on myself, so I became part of my experiment. And now I want to give you the benefit of Mickey Yasugi, who has had, as he will tell you, challenges with his back. And he has decided to implement what we're talking about in a different form of setup. And Mickey, could you grab a microphone or stand up and shout or do we have that? Have Is mic that mic working? You need a microphone? Uh, In Tim, I think. Hey, yeah. Next, after. Uh, you need this? Hey, yeah. <laughs> you take your time, Nick. Uh, just, just as a, a I, you know, I saw a lot of hands raising before. How many people have had back issues relative to the game? 
Mickey, there's your, yeah. you know, there's your audience. <laughs> you can help some of these people. So uh, I met Art miraculously one day, uh, about a week after I had a rear end car accident, that uh, after talking with orth orthopedic surgeons, they said that I either have to quit golf or change my swing. Now, how many of you can just go out there and change a swing? Not very many. How many of you know of a swing that won't hurt your back? or as is focused on longevity versus performance. I don't know one. And so I was, I was left with x-rays of lower disc degeneration from swinging restricted methods for, since high school. Um, I'm 38 now, so I've been doing it for you know, a few years. And it turns out that the swings I was doing created degeneration in my lower back. Uh, and the doctors had said, you know, degeneration is normal if you're 50, 60 years old. Not to say it won't happen, but in my case, it was literally from golf. Um, so with the accident, I also had an annular tear. I think you've heard Tiger had an annular tear as well, but mine was right at the joint where my hip and spine meet, and I had L4 degeneration, which is my lumbar spine, fourth disc up, and I have other degeneration above that as well, but. Uh, I was at a point where uh, the day after the accident, I went to show a student a swing. I just took a swing like this, and I, I literally buckled to the floor. So now I was sitting there going, okay, I can't quit golf because that's my life. I've been doing this since I was seven. What am I going to do? And it's also my livelihood since I teach. Uh, so I bu busted up Ben Hogan's book. I figured if he went through a debilitating car accident and he could hit a ball and win, I might as well try that. It didn't work. I mean, it was, it was painful to the point where I was in tears. So I meet Art literally a week after that, and he comes over generously say, hey, why don't you try this? And I'm thinking, what is this guy talking about? He sounds like a scientist, it's pseudoscience, it's nonsense. So I go home and I tell my wife about this, and she says, well, what is he? I'm like, he's a rocket scientist. So I was like, well, maybe I should listen to him. <laughs> so, you know, I, I implemented a lot of what he just talked about with the bumpy back, and, and I don't feel pain now. Usually you go warm up, and even after a warm up session, you play golf, you feel pain. I don't feel pain swinging a golf club. I can't get out of vacuuming, that still gives me pain. I can't get around that with my wife. But uh, even trimming hedges, I've actually was trimming hedges one day after I learned this bumpy back thing and I, I was sitting on top of the ladder and I was all off balance. And so I sat there, I set my hip in this bumpy back position and all of a sudden I'm sitting there with this chainsaw, no problem. I'm just going at it. My wife comes out, she's like, what are you doing? I'm all, Trimming the hedges. She's like, what's wrong with your hip? I'm like, this is how you balance. And she just turned around and walked back in the house. But what turned out to be oh, just something I was going to throw out the window, I took to heart because I had no other answers. And since I've implemented this, till this day, I have no pain swinging a golf club. By the way, by the way, Mickey's hit it over 400 yards in long drive tournaments before. He's a black belt in Aikido. A judo. A judo. Just also in the background. So yeah, with, with the x-rays now, uh, they're seeing no extra degeneration. I mean, it happens over time, but my annular tear has healed. Uh, and so the things that I've implemented with Bubby Back, I'm no longer straining my spine. I'm actually isolating the, the lumbar spine and rotating the entire body. So uh, you know, there's a lot more heel, uh, lead heel lifting, a lot more of what the old school swings used to look like. Um, but you know, we've worked around some of the, the things that may go wrong with that kind of a swing, but the key is I no longer have back pain. And Art said it himself, he, he's fallen off of a ladder as well. And he, he has no back pain swinging the golf club and I've implemented this with my students. And not just for longevity, the performance is, is incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 145 pounds and I'm hitting 300 yards with no pain. So, I mean, if that's not a testament, I don't know. And, and you can imagine that if there's any, res, any residual pain or a residual potential discomfort, his body would reflex around that, and that would mess up the swing that he was trying to have. So that by setting him in a position where that's no longer an issue, then it's like he's got a new back because he's got a new location as to where the forces are going. The forces are not going into the area where the nerve had previously been pinched. And let me tell you where that started, Nick. I, sure. I haven't done this with you or anybody else. And, and Tim, you will be next, babe. So just get ready if you don't mind. Uh, I was fortunate enough. Is Dr. Borzer here, Dave Borzer? No. Well, that's a shame because uh, I'm indebted to a lot of people. Obviously, Billy giving me a forum like this to talk. Uh, Dave Borzer in 2007 moved his facilities from, I think, La Harbor. Uh, I'm not sure of that. But I am sure that they ended up at the Marriott. Uh, uh, a little nine-hole course in El Segundo, California. 
And when he went there, he condensed about a 6,000 square foot facility into 600. And so one day somebody said, hey, there's a new guy in town and he's over there at the Marriott and he's got a lot of technical looking stuff. So the next morning I actually went right in there and introduced myself and he had force plates and he had K vests and he had devices that Billy has where it kind of makes your feet imbalanced and things of that nature. And we became pretty good golf friends because I knew a little bit about what he was trying to measure from the scientific standpoint. And so one fine day he said, Art, you gotta come over here because a gentleman is coming from Australia that is known as the best physical therapist as far as golf is concerned. I'll tell you, unfortunately, his name is Ramsey McMaster and he's deceased. He died at 49, what a, what a travesty. But anybody who's got an Australian name that's played golf to any level at all, revered Ramsey. And so Ramsey, because of Australia having a lot of sand dunes, would come to the United States pre-announced and get some students and he would take them to Manhattan Beach, California, where there is a huge sand dune that comes up towards the ocean, then comes up very steeply at almost 45 degrees and levels off where all the houses have that beautiful view of the ocean. So I show up early in the morning and Ramsey was a spark plug. I mean, he was an A-type. He handed me a camera, he said, come with me. And he had somebody with him from Canada and he said, we gotta get through by noon because Matt Scoggin is coming. And so he was bringing in some of his Australian, at least one of them, to do whatever he does, which I knew nothing about because I just met the man. And we go over to Sand Dune Hill and he and this gentleman, whose name happens to be Phil, are come running up this hill, then the steep part, get to the top, and I'm filming it all. That's my job, right? Just, just like Jim is doing here. So uh, I get to the top and Phil standing as I am here, Ramsey standing here, and I'm behind Phil. And Phil says, uh, hey Ramsey, I've been working on this for six months now in Canada. He had evidently either been to Australia before or Ramsey might have been there before that. And so he said, take a look at my golf swing. So he's got his shirt off. And what was different and new to me is that there were these black marks, the kind of pencils you, or crayons you'd use on that thing, and his scapulas were marked out, and his spine was marked out, and his iliacs were marked. And so Phil took a swing, and he said, how is that, Ramsey? And Ramsey said, okay. Well, you can imagine that Phil went to Australia, and now he's down from Canada to the United States. He spent a couple of bucks taking these physiological lessons from Ramsey and he wants his back to be working. And so I'm just looking at what's going on there and I saw the way he was set up. And Phil was not happy. He said, it can't be, I should make some progress. And I turned to Ramsey and I said, I can fix that. He said, why? <laughs> Your rocket guy is gonna fix that? I said, yeah, I think I can fix that, watch. I said, Phil, do you know what your coccyx is? And Phil said, I'm a doctor. I said, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. You certainly know what that is. I said, Phil, take your coccyx and point it behind your right foot. And by pointing it to your right foot, you notice my hip went back to it. And that, that, I knew I only had one chance, and I had to make the most of it, right? So he did that, and I said, now swing as hard as you can. And so he's there, and he swings as hard as he can. And Ramsey said, how'd you do that? I said, what did I do? He said, everything fired properly. I said, Ramsey, you see that little mark on his back? He had a laminectomy. I said, when he was swinging for you, he obviously was swinging around that fascia that had been opened up to be able to have that operation. He's been healthy for six months. I just gave him permission to use his body in a way that it should have been used all the time. So that's where Bumpy Back came from, Billy. <clears throat> That he came from a, a really, well, at least the experiment came from someone that really understands how the glutes fire, you've heard that expression before, and how the internal muscles associated with the right hip work. And I, I just wanted to finish with that, Tim, which is, how are we doing on time, Bill? Ten minutes. Oh, James, we're in great shape. Uh, I'm going to get down to the feet. Come on, come on, come on up here. Timothy Paul Mitchell, you know. In fact, Tim, I'll let you go now. Please do that. Go. So yeah, just, so Tim has been nice enough to come up from Pelican Hill to Mike? Rancho now and then, and 
He has been the test. Wow, that's great. He has brought with him the, uh, the body track, but I don't so much get into the body track as much as we spent some time together and we've talked about bumpy backs and coccyxes and things like that. What's it, what, what has happened with you and your students? And, and let it all hang out. Listen, I want to kick in the ass just as much as I want to pat on the back. Sure. I really do, because uh, this is important. Um, I think my uh, place I'd like to start with is, uh, I thought Art was a mad scientist first. You know, I mean, half the stuff was you know, way above my head. And it took me a couple days to try and, try and digest it. And then I come back the next week and, and I had more questions. And, uh, you know, and Art would you know, kind of keep you know, talking to me a language up here. But uh, um, I think one of the neat things that I can share with you guys after really experimenting with this now for probably close to uh, maybe three months is uh, um, I really believe, you know, with body track, uh, I study balance uh, probably a lot more than a lot of us have the opportunity to do so. And uh, by making a simple adjustment with uh, uh, the right foot, the right, uh, just flaring out that right foot, finding the right spot for everybody, and immediately, I, I can't think of anybody that hasn't helped their balance with. Now, I don't know if it necessarily immediately starts to help them with you know, striking the right part of the golf ball, changing ball flights, all that other kind of stuff. We still, need, we'll see, we still need to help out with that. But from a perspective of immediately having somebody that looks like now they're in balance at the end of their golf swing, that it helps them counterbalance the forces of the golf club that are pulling them so much towards the golf ball itself. Uh, I love it. I think it's fantastic. So um, that would probably be my, just my, my, my really biggest uh, comment. Uh, the body track uh, really does see the trace go. I don't know how much you guys are familiar with body track or force plates or pressure plates, but you know, uh, out of the 15 or 20 clients that I put them through, uh, I would certainly say that 80% of them, uh, the trace gets a lot tighter. Uh, that it's not so much from heel to toe, uh, that uh, the trace backwards and forwards get significantly cleaner. So just from a perspective of balance, you know, it's not the, it's not the end all, uh, it helps, I mean, everybody with balance. It doesn't obviously uh, necessarily get to the next part of teaching, but from a perspective of balance and if balance and, uh, and, and club and ball interaction are probably, at least in my opinion, maybe even two rhythm, uh, the, the three absolutes in the game that everybody seems to get better with, uh, it's a great place. It's a great place to start, great place to, to build your game upon. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and I say what I consider the, to be the best for last, and not for any cute reason, but I want to tie it all together as you started to. So if we can think about establishing the tempo with those baseball swings, because that will establish the resonance. And you can flare your foot to the midway be point between the internal rotation and the external rotation. And you can just move that hip back or a little more refinement is to get the coccyx to point to the rear foot mm -hmm. so that you have some, some weight and some activity going back here. Here's the part where I'm going to start World War III with the golf community, and you are all invited to get on the other side of me because this is a bad one from the standpoint of acceptance. I've looked at the angular rate with which the backswing can take place, and I can tell you slower is better, and you probably knew all that. So I went into the body and said, now how can I get a slower, repeatable backswing, not violate dynamic balance and iota? And it put me into a two month study of all the muscles associated with the hip joint, the femur, the acetabulum, the pelvic floor, the intra-abdominal pressure. So I'm not showing off for you. I'm telling you that at least to my satisfaction, and I would like real scientists, real body scientists, to start verifying this stuff. I am absolutely convinced in my own case and anybody else that will pay attention to me, which is this last six month phase of the total balance picture, is that the muscles in your hip, just some of the major characteristics, there's muscles that kind of go across laterally here. And if you contract those muscles, you can see that you start backswing. These muscles just get shorter. Now the beauty of that is, you can really go back fast with your arms, right? You can really go back fast with your shoulders. In fact, you can go really back fast with your hips. But you can't do that if you establish 
this hip, which is only four inches from the center of your body, the center of that hip joint is only four, ladies, it's four inches and an eighth or something like that. It's a little bit bigger for the babies. So the point of the matter is, if you can think about this hip being an axis of rotation like the door jam for those doors, and you decide that you are going to contract these muscles to start the backswing, you will take the backswing at an angular rate which will blow the socks off your results. You will not believe the fact that as long as you don't do something with your hips and then throw your hands in some crazy position, but let the entire takeaway activity be the contraction of those muscles, then the only thing you have left to do is the downswing. In the downswing, all you need to do is World War III again. You don't need to stop on that. Shift your weight. Make it go to 1.5 body weights. That's a bunch of baloney. What you need to do is simply relocate your lead leg, if it's up in the air, if it's on the ground, to be somewhat vertical. Inside the body, you get your balance from your eyes and your ears. They not do anything for you in golf. The balance in golf comes from a whole system of neurology called proprioceptors and mechanical receptors. And you've got maybe a hundred different control systems inside your body, and they're running information around, and they're doing something about it. So if you start your backswing with this, and then just relocate this such that it's vertical, you can take a look at Hogan. You can. You notice I've never mentioned any other golfers, but I know that's you people live and die on what other golfers look like. I heard poor boy talk about. You know, I saw a lot of pictures. Jesus, I didn't look like such and such. And, and I got to change this because of that. The system that I am trying to document now is called Body Golf. We have a website that's called B O D I G O L F. And the history of Body Golf is in there. And the point of the matter is that it stands for body optimized, not golfer optimized, not teacher optimized. You didn't need to optimize help with picking up a glass of water or walk into the bathroom. Why do we torture ourselves trying to teach how to swing a golf club? Why don't we just get the body's axes of rotation stable and let the body perform the swing? So my 10 years of study have resulted in body-optimized dynamics, BOD, and body-optimized integration. And I'll quit on integration by just saying this, since I am a rocket guy. Whoops, Billy, I'm sorry. And if you're playing, is there a marker here, Billy? I don't see it. Okay, and we'll, we'll just wait. So uh, I hope many of you can picture the kinematic sequence of anybody's swing being on there. And you see these four mountains. That's the, the hips turning, the shoulders turning, the lead arm turning, and then the club going up to a max of 22, 2300 degrees a second. That's called the kinematic sequence. The point that I'm getting at, each one of those mountains is like a stage of a rocket. Stage one, stage two, stage three. If we put all the propellant in the first stage of the rocket, we'd never get to orbit. You need to allocate that amount of energy amongst the systems that will produce the rocket's velocity, or in this case, the club's velocity. The body really knows how to do that. Because when you're compensating, sometimes you're out of position, your hands will make up for your shoulder. Your shoulder might make up for your hips. Until you tell it what to do. Once you tell it what to do, now you're in charge, not the body any longer. And that's the mistake that I think the learning profession needs to give the body a chance with each student getting balanced to create the swing themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art. Unfortunately, the range isn't open at all today, but tomorrow, anyone wants to try it? I think you're staying tomorrow as well? No, I can't stay tomorrow. Really. Okay. Well, you can always come to me or, or Tim, and we can share with you what it looks like, what it feels like. Bill Holbert? Yeah, Art, I mean, I've got multiple questions that all are related to why are we doing this, what do we get out of it. The only really answer I got was Tim saying that it improves the trace. And we don't have time for all that now, but I 
I, I certainly think at some point I, I'd like to hear you get a little more detail about what's this creating. Is it load? Is it function? Is it a multiple things? But the one question I have that you can't answer in the time we have left is you set the, the flare of the, of the trail foot, but what about the flare of the lead foot? Are you doing the same thing with it that you did that, in the trail foot? It, it, it's a trial and error thing there too, Bill. I just didn't happen to go there in the time that was associated with that. I don't have, the starting point should always be someplace in the middle of your internal and external rotation because you don't know how your fingers fit into your acetabulum, the sockets. And since you don't know that, if you decide to plant your feet like Hogan said or somebody else said, you're going to be limiting in one of the other directions. But I can tell you this, that if in fact you flare the rear foot, you just give your permission for that front foot to go where it's going to go. Let the body optimize that. It's going to come off the ground. And if it comes off the ground, then it's not going to be restrictive in any way. We just don't want it to restrict the rate of backswing. And if you can do that with the foot on the ground, that'll be fine too. But you'll find at our age, Bill, that you start to wanting to get more range in the backswing, and that foot will come up. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of good literature out now that's saying pick it up on purpose. And I'm, I'm telling you that I, at least my experiments show that when you tell something to do it on purpose, you put a whole set of new equations into that brain that, that find conflict in how the body would have operated that if you just let it make its own decisions. As far as the other thing is concerned, Bill, I'm dying to get together with a ball and a bat and a golf club with you because that's the only way that you're going to come into my belief system. It's, you're not doing words. I cannot do it with charts. I've done it 400 times. People make their own determination as to whether or not they get better. There's Brett Blazer. He's experienced it a little bit, so maybe you want to say something, Brett. But I would like to hit some balls. Let's talk to Art at the lunch time. At lunch, if you want to talk to him, or afterward, when the day's over, feel free. It's lunch time for about 45 minutes, and then we'll get to our sponsors, and then uh, uh, Mike Neff, of course. Thank you very much, Art. That was really great. Got a little gift for you. <laughs>